This is continuing live courtroom coverage of the Take Care of Maya trial from the Hidden Killers podcast and True Crime Today. The court has before it actually two separate uh, motions uh, for directed verdict. Uh, the first is the general directed verdict motion with respect to medical malpractice. The court finds that the plaintiffs have presented a prima facie case and it's going to be able to go to the jury, so the court will deny uh, the motion with respect to medical malpractice. With respect to the question of apparent agency with respect to Dr. Sally Smith, again, the court finds that there's a prima facie case here, and it's now a jury question on the question of uh, apparent agency. So I'll deny that motion as well. What's next, Mr. Altenberg? Uh, and I'm going to try to do this very brief. Count 14 is the negligent training count. It's hard for me to ne- make a motion for a directed verdict because the way it stands right now, we haven't settled on what the jury instruction is, whether it's a medical malpractice standard of care, which I heard opinions this morning within a reasonable medical probability. Right now the standard instruction given to me is a is different than that. I, I think we need to argue about what this claim is before I can – with jury instructions before I can move for a directed verdict on that. But what I can move for a directed verdict on now is that it is a claim for negligence. And their theory, by the way, is that they can get direct monetary damages here for negligent training without proving that anybody did anything negligent underneath this. And that just doesn't fly. But more importantly, I listened carefully to Dr. Corcoran, who's been their primary expert on this. And if we're looking just at negligent training, there's no physical injury caused by impact resulting from the training. Now, admittedly, there may be from doctors who committed medical malpractice because they didn't receive adequate training in medical school. I don't think the statute they're relying upon actually requires the hospital to provide more than an hour's worth of training on, on risk management issues. But one way or the other, the, the claims here are really claims that, that aren't separate standalone claims for, for negligence. This is simply something you can use if you can't prove medical negligence. The, I, I, I gave you a memo, a, a motion that we never managed to hear this part of on, on the critical jury instruction issues. It's at, I think, DIN 33. 96, if I can read my handwriting. But the case law on these training issues is normally in federal cases where the person isn't deemed to be an employee or in cases where they're otherwise outside the scope and course. It's not in this situation. So in the absence of some evidence from Dr. Corcoran and the like that that not only did they breach the standard of care, but that as a result of that, there was some kind of physical injury from impact on a negligence claim, they don't have a claim here on this. Mr. Elliott. Your Honor, I think uh, we have not gotten together on this. I think uh, our predecessor had had some conversations, but this, I, I agree, this is really part of medical malpractice. I mean, that's how you get to part of what happened here. But there is, I understand, testimony um, from Dr. Brewerton, Henschke, Duncan, uh, and others that, that the training was lacking here, that, that, that these, that some of these things may have been taking place because the doctors, they didn't know how to recognize CRPS. Um, that rolls over into the medical malpractice claim, but that, you know, and, and perhaps it should be treated as a subpart of that, but that's still a claim, uh, and it's still uh, evidence that should come in. So, uh, and again, uh, we're still working on the jury instructions, but that's one that I can easily see how that could be rolled in. Anything else, Mr. Altenberg? Um No, I think that speaks for itself. What I'll do is I'll take that one under advisement, and we'll deal with that uh, on Wednesday when you, at 3.30 when we talk about jury instructions. Okay. The last thing I want to cover, I don't think it'll take more than 20 minutes or so to get this done, is is the battery and the false imprisonment and the related punitive parts of this um, count. That's count two and, and I believe count five, if I'm not mistaken. And So are, are you dealing with them together? 
there are very similar arguments, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to fit them in together because they're both claims that result in punitive damage. So, so I'm clear you're moving for directed verdict on the false imprisonment claim, you're moving for directed verdict on the battery claim, and then you're moving for directed verdict with respect to punitive damages. The re related punitive damages. Okay. And I'm probably not moving for directed verdict on each and every part of this. And that, so I'm, I need to break this down for you. In, in count two alleging false imprisonment, it's three claims. One for that week of October 7th to October 13th. One for the EEG room on the 18th and 20th of October. And the third for the two hours or so on January 6th. And as to each of those, the, the analysis of, the, of the, the tort and the punitive damage is a little bit different. On the claim between October 7th and 13th, forgetting there's probably a, a day in there that I do have immunity for, but I'm not going to worry about that for directed verdict. Um, the, the, there is evidence that the family wants to take the child out. This child has been sent there from, by Dr. Hanna to go to an emergency room. The child is in either an emergency room or a pediatric intensive care unit. There is nobody that's got on the stand as an expert and said that that child didn't belong in an emergency room or an ICU unit, unit during that time period. So for a false imprisonment, the question is whether or not uh, we restrained the jury instruction on this is whether we without legal authority intentionally caused Maya Kowalski to be restrained against her will in a manner that was unreasonable and unwarranted under the circumstances. Now, without legal authority might be a problem in this case for at least a chunk of this time. But you're talking about the 24 hour issue. Yes. Yeah. But the facts are that they brought a child in that had serious enough medical situation, whatever it was, that she needed to be in an intensive care unit at that time, period of time. Mama is not wanting to take this child out to transfer the child to another hospital. There's no arrangements to do that. There, admittedly, Dr. Hanna has on his schedule some appointment with the child a, a, a day or two later. There's no evidence that he was going to provide more ketamine to that child then or ever at this point in time. So the evidence here is that they want the hospital to roll Maya out in her wheelchair up to the curb, put her in, in their car to take her home. For a mother who is a nurse infusionist who has IV grade ketamine in her home. Well, I mean, the reality yes. is, though, that there is evidence that Jack Kowalski said he wanted to take her yep. out and was threatened with right. arrest. So does so, that kind of defeat your argument? I mean, I understand right. you're, the, the, the jury might agree that the, the right. balance of the evidence is that there's no false imprisonment. The biggest thing, I, I figured that you would deny that on the claim for intent. But when you get to the punitive damages claim, those doctors who said no, we're, we're not letting you out, and even if they said we're going to ask that you be arrested, um, that the standard on this is that the employee engaged in, in intentional misconduct. The alternative is gross negligence, but what we have here is an intentional tort, and no one's ever alleged negligence, let alone gross negligence, about this event. But when you look at the definitions, intentional misconduct for punitive is the defendant had actual knowledge of the wrongfulness of the conduct and the high probability that injury or damage to the claimant would result, and despite that knowledge, intentionally pursued that course of conduct resulting in injury or damage. I'm sorry, but my doctors in deciding to keep her in the intensive care unit didn't violate the intentional misconduct standard. This shouldn't be going to the jury against them on punitive damages, and that means even if there were proof that there was some management level thing done by the hospital, it shouldn't go to, 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 against the hospital either. This, fail, this one fails on punitive damages. Now, as to the second one in the EEG room, um, you know, she has said that she's trapped there. And the full 48-hour tape isn't there, and we haven't discussed it. So 
I think there's a prima facie case at this point in time that it goes to the jury as to whether or not she was, was trapped there as well. But the question of whether or not, again, it meets the intentional misconduct of the gross negligence standards. She, this child had been moved from one room to another room to another room. And by the way, I'm not sure it's accurate, but she's testified there was a, a surveillance camera in every single one of those rooms. We just moved her into another room with another surveillance camera that was, in fact, on, and she didn't know it. And so... Um, well, I think she testified but, but, she was specifically told it wasn't working or wasn't on or something right. like that. And, and admittedly, the toilet situation was different in all of that. But from the stand, is there a high probability that injury or damage to the claimant would result from that? And I don't think there's enough to go to punitive damages on the EEG room. Um, as to the restraint for two hours on, on January 6th, th there is evidence that, that I think is sufficient to go to the jury on the primary count there. There, there. The evidence is that the people doing this were, were told by people above them, but the highest person in this, in this chain is a quote-unquote risk manager in the risk management department. Risk management is, is, is a term used because the statutes use that term. There's no evidence. Was this Patty Condon? I forget. Patty Condon. What her job description is, what level she is, that they have to have her be at a sufficient management level that she basically speaks for the corporation, and they haven't shown that she's anything other than the lowest person in the risk management department. So I don't think that they have proven by clear and convincing evidence, which is what they have to do, that they have a claim that even if there was something that rose to the level of, of punitive at the individual employee level, translates to a claim against the hospital because management made a decision that fit within the statute. So I don't believe this one goes to the, to the jury on punitive damages as well. I can run through the battery ones as well if you want to. There's three battery ones about the same kind of arguments. So sure. on, on battery, there are, there are claims against Catherine Beatty or about Catherine Beatty that, are, that kind of break into two categories. One is that she hugged and patted, slapped, or otherwise gave unwanted affection to Maya Kowalski in the chapel and I think maybe in some other places. The other is that she committed battery in conjunction with that photographing session on January 6th. I think there's two different things going on there. With, again, for the testimony that she gave the hugs and, and the like, as a technical tort, intent for, for battery is, is fairly limited. If you do this conduct and with that the other party would expect to be offensive. And I believe that this is enough to go to the jury on that. But, again, when you go to the punitive damages section, this conduct, she didn't hit the child, she didn't slap the child, there's no bruises, there, there's, you know, not the normal things that one thinks about when one talks about a battery on, on a human being. And for this to be something that fits into the definition where she was doing something that rose to the level of intentional misconduct or even though unplayed gross negligence by hugging this child in the chapel and having her on her lap, I, I don't, under those definitions, this is not enough for punitive damages against her. And more, and equal important, since only the hospital is left in this, there's no knowledge that anybody other than the two of them were involved in this. There's no knowledge that anybody saw these things at that time. So, and the, and there are theories that this was, you know, ratified that the risk management department admitted they knew nothing about any of these things. They couldn't, the, at the corporate level, ratify this because they didn't even know about these things. So I don't think this goes to punitive damages against the hospital. As to the, Ju the January 6th incident, 
I'm, I'm not contesting that there's prima facie evidence that can go to the jury on whether or not that's a battery uh, in, in that situation. Um, a, as to her, she was told to do it. It's not like it was an idea from her. And again, the proof as to where it was that the decision was made and whether that was at an, it, it certainly wasn't an officer, director, or, or the board for this hospital. And the people that they've had, they really haven't, they didn't call them the stand, they haven't done anything to explain at what level they are in the, in the hospital that would make them have the authority under the case law that it takes to be a manager in this situation. They had a duty to prove that by clear and convincing evidence, so I think we're entitled to a directed verdict okay. on Let that. Let me make sure I understand what you're actually moving for yep. directed verdict. With respect to battery, you are not moving for directed verdict on the hugs and kisses or the photo session, you are simply moving for directed verdict as to uh, claim for punitive damages for those two that, that's correct. complaints. With respect to the false imprisonment, you're not moving for punitive damages with respect to any of the three instances, but you are moving for directed verdict with respect to the punitive well, damages. I did move for false imprisonment. For directed on, on the first one. On the you, October you, 7th? I think you denied that. <laughs> well, I think you said that you, would, you thought that I was going to deny it. I don't That's think true. I technically didn't, didn't denied it. Didn't, I didn't say I didn't move for it. You, I think you denied that one. The other two I was conceding on. Okay, so to, to, to be clear, I will go ahead now officially deny the um, directed verdict with respect to the October 7th through October 13th um, motion. Uh, since there was none made on the non-punitive damage component for the balance, all we really need to talk about is the punitive yeah. damage. More live courtroom coverage of the Take Care of Maya trial from the Hidden Killers podcast and True Crime Today is coming up. Press subscribe now.